Procter and Gamble reporting fourth quarter results just moments ago. Earnings dollar thirty seven was a nickel ahead of expectations. Revenue of twenty point five five a billion also beat the street's expectations almost by a uh, billion dollars. Uh, strong sales growth was driven by a seven percent increase from higher prices, uh, but that was slightly offset by a one percent decrease in shipment volumes. Joining us now to break down the numbers, John Moeller. P&G chairman, president, and CEO for, for next year. John, this is a fourth quarter, fiscal fourth, 625 to 643. Uh, the estimate that the street has is uh, right around 638. That, that's, a, that's not a bad bump in earnings per share, up 6 to 9%. Uh, is that conservative? Is that, is that higher than you thought before? <laughs> Well, we've certainly been encouraged by the quarter that we just uh, completed. Eight um, percent organic sales growth, every category growing. Five of the categories growing in double digits. Seven out of ten building share. The same story on a on a geographic basis. Every region growing. If you look at the U.S., our largest country, uh, sales up six percent. Uh, value share up twenty basis points. Volume share up uh, fifty basis points. And within that, uh, you mentioned, you know, pricing and volume. Uh, volume is coming along uh, nicely. So if you look at the U.S., last four quarters, minus three, minus three, zero, plus three in the quarter that we just completed. And the bottom line, uh, which you were asking about, uh, was also very good, up 13 percent, up 22 percent on a constant currency basis. So that definitely provides momentum and gives us confidence. As we uh, as we head into next fiscal year, which started 29 days ago, organic sales growth of eight percent. We always talk about that. Last time you were on, what were you? What, what was your range? That's above the high end of the range, isn't it, or, or is it within the range? We were estimating about six at the time that you and I last talked. Uh, so, as I said, momentum is generally building. We mentioned the, the price increases. Is that? You're talking about in the future maybe commodity prices uh, moderating a little. Foreign exchange might not help, but are you seeing it some some moderation of the inflationary environment you've been operating in? It's mixed. So yes, some of the commodities are uh, turning. The transportation market has has more or less uh, flattened out. On the other hand, you have uh, elements of the commodity market. Um, and uh, and labor, for example, that are still very tight. So it's a mixed picture, uh, but from an inflation standpoint, a, a better picture uh, than we certainly would have seen at this time uh, last year. So the same thing that when we report, and we're going to get some inflation numbers today, the same thing that we've been seeing, a, a steady downward positive trend in, in inflation. You You can as the you know one of the biggest consumer products companies, maybe the biggest in the world, you're seeing it. You're, you can confirm that what the, the government data that we're seeing, inflation's moderating. Yes, agree with that. As you also mentioned, <laughs> just to get the whole picture, uh, foreign exchange is still uh, tough. We're looking at about 400 million dollars after tax of headwinds as we head into next year on that front. But again, uh, as is reflected in our uh, earnings guidance, uh, generally a positive picture. What is your forecast for organic sales growth next quarter and for, for uh, next year? For the year, we're guiding to 4 to 5 percent growth uh, from an organic sales standpoint. And the reason for the difference between the 8 percent that we just delivered is less pricing, reflecting less commodity cost increase. Really? So that's where, in the organic numbers, that has to do with being able to, to raise prices and to have them stick and, and to not have people go uh, trade down to something else, not, not get a brand name Procter & Gamble product? Uh, yes, it reflects that. And, and we've been very happy with, about, with our progress there. We've made large investments in what we refer to as superiority of product, package, communication, go to market, and, and value. And that's paid off uh, extremely well. Uh, we've built share. We were building share pre-COVID. We built share during COVID. We built share post-COVID, um, and there is some trade down within the portfolio. But the net is uh, is, is loyalty the, to brands that do the job in categories where performance largely drives brand choice. Has the uh, the motivation to add to your niche offerings is that lessening? I mean, it, it almost seems like 
you've doubled down on all your great brand names, the ones that we're looking at right there. I don't see any, I don't know which generation, I don't, I, I'm so confused by the letters for which generations, but some generations, <laughs> they, they want the, you know, the stuff they've never heard of that's like, I don't know, gluten-free and, and, uh, and free-range shampoo, or I don't, I don't even understand how it works, but you, you've stopped doing that, have you? Are you still scouring the, the, the uh, out there, the, these brands out there to add to your product portfolio for that we're, niche? We're always looking for uh, brands that can become large, but we are a large brand company and that is our focus. If we look back over almost any period of time, at least within our portfolio, the large brands have grown at a faster rate, certainly in, in absolute terms, than some of the smaller brands. And, you know, there was a big debate, oh, and I think you and I might have had it five or six years ago about the death of big brands and small brands yeah. were going to be all that mattered. And, and my question <laughs> to you at the time was, if, if big brands don't matter, how, how are they big? <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. Right. Doesn't no, make sense. Nobody goes to that restaurant anymore. It's way too crowded. I know. It's the, it's the same uh, phenomenon I think we're seeing.